So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Really, really great to be here and to be um, sharing this presentation with you. Um, myself and Claire have worked together for a very, very long time. We actually met uh, when we worked at Race for Life in 2006. So, yeah, we've known each other a very long time um, and now have our own company, which we've had for 10 years. So, we're just going to have a chat through um, a little bit about kind of where we started and kind of how we got to where we are now. And we're also then going to talk a little bit about ARC, but not too long. But then we've got some really kind of, we've got four case studies that we're going to talk through of different events that we have worked on. Um, a little bit from kind of beside, behind the scenes, some of our kind of the successes of those events, but also the learnings of them. Um, there's obviously every event you go to, you learn something new. And I think that's definitely the case with every event we've been at and normally in many, many learnings. Um, and then we've got some kind of top tips at the end, which we kind of gathered from a few different people um, that we work with in the industry and a few of our kind of key things that we definitely take to each event as we kind of deliver our events. So without further ado, we'll just do our introductions and then we'll crack on. So yeah, I'll pass over to Claire to do her introduction. Excellent. Sorry, it was the presentation was halfway through. We we're just checking something uh, before the meeting. So lovely to meet everybody. Uh, my name is Claire Hartley. It's great to see some familiar faces on the call today. Um, for those who don't know me, my journey to being in major sports events um, started quite a while ago. I do quite a bit of lecturing and I'm always a little bit hesitant now that I start with Sydney 2000 when a lot of the students weren't actually born. Um, but I studied at the University of Nottingham, nothing to do with um, events. I studied biochemistry and loved playing netball and ran a tour to South Africa and organised lots of different teams and everything there. And I loved doing that. So when I graduated in 2000, went over to Sydney. I worked on the Olympics and Paralympic Games there as a runner, like really down at the, at the bottom, got an Access All Areas accreditation and thought this was the best thing ever and didn't realise that you could actually work in events like this. Just absolutely loved it. Moved back home and worked on the Commonwealth Games, which were in um, 2002 in my home city of Manchester. Loved it again, got really good experience there. Moved over to the Special Olympics World Games, which were held in Dublin in 2003 and then worked over MetX at Race for Life, which is great grounding for lots and lots of people who are in events. We keep meeting people in the world who are from Race for Life, mass participation, charity event, um, really good grounding in events. I then worked at UK Sport as one of the event consultants, working across Olympic and Paralympic events, leading into London 2012. And I was at London 2012 for three years. First of all, did all the planning for the central London venues, um, in and around Buckingham Palace and all the different things there. And I ended up being the road events general manager, doing all the um, cycling and running and different things out on the streets. So after London 2012, I was like, I don't want to work this hard ever again in my entire life. And um, so Vex and I set up Arc Event Consultancy, which we'll give you a bit more information about. So I'll pass you back to Vex. Cool. So slightly different start. I um I actually did quite a lot of travelling um, early on. I was at Leeds University, did similar. I kind of was very much into organising events, but didn't really realise there was a career in it. I did a degree in geography, um, but then I actually went abroad and did some teaching abroad in kind of Spain, Japan and Southern Africa. Also did some coaching, um, but wherever I went, I always was organising things, um, always organising the get togethers, or organising tours, organising travel. Um, and so when I came back, realised that it would be quite good to get into a job where I could organise things. And then I came across Race for Life. And that's, as we said, met Claire. Um, I was all organising the events all around the southwest of the country. So really fortunate that I managed to do all that. And then moved to the 10K series. Um, I then um, had my little boy Eddie and I ended up doing a postgraduate leadership and management course while I was on maternity leave because um, I like to keep myself busy um, and then came out of that and just after that actually ended up getting a job at the Olympics and was on Hyde Park again working with Claire. Um, then as I mentioned we moved on to ARC event consultancy and Actually, in the last year, I've been on the UK Sport Event Leaders Program, um, which is with a few people on this call. I can see her on this course as well. So that's great. 
So just a quick overview of ARC event consultancy. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but one of the reasons we set up ARC was because we came out of London 2012, as Claire said, absolutely knackered, worked, had worked very, very hard and knew that we wanted to stay in events, but didn't want to be traveling, like moving over to Rio or going up to Scotland to work on the Commonwealth Games. We kind of wanted to be able to manage it around family life. So we set up the event consultancy in the hope that we could then be a bit more stipulative about how and what events we worked on, the number of days we did, what hours we did. And we have been very fortunate and we've worked on a number of this with just a few of the events we've worked on in the last 10 years, which we've now, we're about to get to our 10 year anniversary of our company, which we're really proud of. So um, yeah, just give you a bit of an idea, but it's really, really, really great. And we've got loads of great people that we've worked in the industry um, through our company. So we're really grateful for all the support we've had over the last 10 years. So now I'm going to move on to our some of experiences we've had. And the one I've got here that I'm going to want to share with you um, was the Special Olympics. So we have touched, Claire mentioned she worked on the Special Olympics in Dublin in 2003. And um, we then got involved in 2013 at the National Games in Bath and we kind of came in very late to that event and kind of helped sort out all the travel logistics. There were a number of things that hadn't been put in place so worked on that which really enjoyed, was really hard work but the volunteer ethic at the Special Olympics is something that you just can't, you just don't experience anywhere else and it's because the budgets are so tight for Special Olympics that they have to rely on volunteers um, but the volunteer programs for Special Olympics are really really incredible and they really support the volunteers and everyone that support everyone that comes to the event is there because they really want to make a difference um, and so I'm just going to mention because there may be some people on the call that don't know what Special Olympics is so I just thought I'd do a quick just basically Special Olympics is a global organisation driving social change through programmes in sports, health, education, and it's all for people with intellectual disabilities. So um, one of the key things is that it's just a really positive atmosphere because everyone at the event is it's just such a special thing for them to be at. So that positive atmosphere you get, it's just unbelievable. Everyone wants to high five you, everyone wants to hug you. You know, they're so proud of all the medals they have. You get big, you know, every morning they turn up with big smiles on their faces. You can't literally, you can't not turn to work and have a big smile on your face. Um, so it's a very, very special event. And it's got a real common goal for just that inclusion. Everyone is included. Um, and that comes about from the number of medal ceremonies. So everyone gets a medal. Um, it's a really special event in the fact that you really feel that kind of inclusivity and that real kind of worth everyone is there to have an amazing time and actually have um just enjoy themselves and be part of something so the successes are amazing um some of the learnings from that and i think this is we were talking about this earlier myself and claire is that because there are so many volunteers involved in it you haven't got a lot of people with experience with events so you do have to have really clear roles and responsibilities and really clear briefings for everybody because people don't just generally know what they're doing. Um, so that can be a real challenge and definitely can make things quite difficult and you're also normally working with a really skeleton team on some of these events so everyone is kind of everyone's got to pitch in, everyone's just got to get on and deliver it. I think the other th key thing is worth understanding the client group because um, obviously everyone's got intellectual disabilities. There is the fact that you know, you have to be aware of the fact that when you're trying to load a coach, for example, which normally would take you a certain amount of time, you have to then allow that to be double the time. Um, if you're trying to um, get people on and off a grandstand, for example, again, it, it's, you can have a grandstand available there for them. But again, loading everybody on there, taking everyone off, it does take a very long time. So all your timings have to allow for that, which I would say in that detailed planning stage, we probably weren't aware of that when we were the event directors in 2017 in Sheffield. We just didn't quite get the, all that planning down to a T. So when we were actually delivering the event, we found ourselves constantly working on trying to, to catch up because we hadn't quite realised how long everything was going to take to get to certain bits. So from that point of view, it's just that real pre-planning and understanding the client groups and how they can all be very different. I think. When I went, I went to the World Games in 2019 in Abu Dhabi, and again, it was fantastic in the fact that 
you couldn't, it was so inclusive and it was a really special experience and the volunteers there were exceptional. I mean, they really were really amazing and they were just so excited to be there. But I think, again, the challenges were at the venue I was at, they hadn't really planned for the medal ceremonies and there were 48 medal ceremonies and um, just the logistics of trying to get all the people off. I was at Tempin Bowling, had interesting sports, um, but getting everyone off from the Tempin Bowling and then doing all the medal ceremonies and getting everyone. So all the logistics of moving people was really, really difficult and that just hadn't been planned through. So I think, again, it was just that really kind of working through kind of how are you going to manage those client groups when you're on site. So and I think the other key thing was just focusing on the priorities with these events it really felt like you aren't able to always deliver everything you want to because of just how complex they are but actually focusing on the priorities making sure that it's all about these athletes really having the best time they possibly can and doing everything you can for those athletes um, and I think it's you really get rewarded from it so if you haven't ever volunteered for Special Olympics and you feel I really can't recommend it enough it's an amazing experience and you just definitely won't regret it so just a few of our backgrounds with special olympics so i'm now going to pass to claire who's going to talk through about road cycling so we decided to do this case study and whilst it's a bit old now because it's um 10 years ago i was recently doing some work with paris 2024 and quite a lot of the work is still quite current and quite a lot of the learnings and the successes are still very valid and, and quite um, good. We, so I worked on the road events in London 2012 and these were um, kind of forgotten a little bit by the organising committee until the test events in 2011. A lot of organising committees and big, especially on Olympics, think about the stadium, the velodrome, they think about the aquatic centre and often um, these beautiful venues that are being built, a uh, big horse guards parade, beach volleyball and different things. And before the test event, I don't think anybody had really thought very much about the road cycling and it didn't fit in with the planning processes that, that Low Cog London 2012 sort of set, it, set up. And so it was, um, I think we had, we for, for the road race, we had seven London boroughs plus the county of Surrey and four different county councils within Surrey, as well as seven different emergency services, two, three royal parks, um, an, an area of special scientific interest that was owned by Natural England, um, and a number of other private stakeholders um, who were involved in those uh, um, three hospices. Um, some snails that we had to look after because they were protected in a protected environment um, and royal palaces that we weren't allowed to touch any of the walls um, and had to get agreement on from, um, from Her Majesty about timings that we could go past Buckingham Palace and there was all these partners who were involved and there was this sense of this unquenchable thirst for knowledge and for information from these multitude of partners and planning and this is where I had to spend the sort of last year leading up to London 2012 is to getting all the agreements in place from all these different stakeholders and passing information around to make sure that the event could be held safely and, and successfully. We went out on road, road cycling with the first day, first race, the first day, 10 o'clock in the morning. And so there was quite a lot of nervousness and a lot of focus on this event. We were hoping for the first GB medal, which we didn't get. But one of the massive successes Whilst it was the worst year of my life professionally in that it was the hardest event I've ever done and the most pressure that I've ever done and I really didn't enjoy it. But the successes looking back were that we built some amazing, amazing partnerships. And I think this is something that I always come back to on events is it's around people and um, really built some trust and ways of working with a multitude of different stakeholders and partners. And when I ran the event control room for the road events. We had 242 people in an event control room um, to try and manage this whole event with a loud loudspeaker that I was on that would do a ding dong to everybody to let them know. And I knew that every single person in that room wanted this to be a massive success and had done everything that they could to make this a massive success. And I think that partnership working is something that has always stayed with me that if people run events, nothing else, just people. And what people can do is amazing if you're all pulling in the same direction. And I think at the time, under 2012, this was probably the biggest footprint an event had ever been held on 
in the UK and we did quite a lot of principles that are still used in um, road event planning now across the country and across the world and I think it was quite groundbreaking in some of that of bringing all those people together which was really successful and a good um, success that came out of, of that event. I think the, the difficulty with having all those different stakeholders um, within and we did so much planning and recently when I've been looking through it I still couldn't it, I can't believe how much detail we went into for getting Meals on Wheels to Mrs Miggins down on number 72 um, down the street in Kingston to put in a delivery van on some sort of road to stop any counter-terrorism attacks from a vehicle. It was incredible, but the planning was so detailed and so massive that we had to keep saying stick to the plan. And I think this is a real good success that we had within London 2012 and something that's really passed through all our event planning is once you've got a plan, you need to stick to the plan because one little thing that you do might affect a huge big thing that somebody else is doing. So quite often somebody new might come into the team or we'd get some person from government who thinks that they knew everything. What about this? Why don't we change this? What, do, what about this? Why don't we do something different? It was like, no, stick to the plan. We've got this plan in place. That's what everybody knows. We have to stick to the plan. So once you've got a good plan in place, stick to it and make sure that pre-plan has been done. One of the big successes from London 2012 was the detail of contingency planning. And this is something, again, that you see across all events. I'm sure lots of people here who are involved in events do all the desktop exercises, scenario planning exercises. And I think London 2012, whilst it was this massive, high profile event, and especially on the road, so much stuff can go wrong that's out of your control. You've got 250 kilometres of route. Uh, we've got a million people watching, you, you know, you can't control everything. But the contingency planning gave us so much confidence going into that event that we felt ready for anything. We, we, was, we had so much other things, police vans all over, bio uh, protection units from the police all over. We, we were ready for anything that got thrown at us. And we actually had on the morning quite a bad fire down on, on a, one of the um, high streets down in Oxshot. And the fire service was so calm and they were like, we've practiced this in our contingency planning. We've got seven tenders. They will all go at the side of the road. We will ensure that we've got motorbikes who can get the race through it. We will ev evacuate people from the other side of the road. We were, we were so um, prepared. We were like, yeah, we expected this. We planned for it. We talked through so many different instances um, that we, we've done a lot of contingency planning that gave us confidence and again, helped with those partnerships. So they were some good successes. Some good learnings that I found from, from London 2012 that we've been passing on to other organising committees is within all these massive organisations, there were too many cooks. And I think it's really hard, um, there's so many people, it's really hard to find the core of people who you need because everybody's putting people, 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 people. And I think sometimes you could just have too many people and it can be really difficult. And decision by committee can become really difficult. I think sometimes it's delayed decision making because there were just so many people and so many different points of view. I think that was a good learning um, for us. I would say in some ways I've put a question mark around overcautious. Olympics and these massive events are cautious by their very um, essence because they need that pro TV programme to go out at that time because they've spent so much money, all these TV organisations, sponsors, they're such huge beasts, they need things to run to time and I think we had so many levels of um, cautiousness of we had three different tiers of communication systems just in case one went wrong then we had the next one just in case that went wrong we had a flipping plane flying around the top um, so that we could have extra contingency on communications. We close the roads 10 hours before we needed them, which really we could probably have done in four, but we just had resilience on resilience on resilience. And we could do that because we had the budget. So we could pay for the stewards to come longer. We could pay for the extra plane to come up. We could play, pay for the extra um, radio signals. But probably in hindsight, we didn't need all that. We probably didn't need, it was probably overspending for the sake of it. And you sometimes see that on events where things are overspent as a safety blanket, because you just in case and just in case. And a lot of events you can't afford to do that. So you've got to go a little bit more, um, a, a little bit less cautious. But I think perhaps in hindsight, London 2012, in some of the planning that we did, were over cautious and overspent because of that. I think another one that comes with these huge events is a lack of flexibility. So um, if we wanted to make any 
tweaks or changes as we went through the events, as we learned from one event to another, it was very difficult to get any flexibility. And I think that then perhaps negatively affected some of the events where we should have incorporated learnings as we went through the event a little bit more. Still makes me shudder a bit when I see some of those photos because it makes me nervous about <laughs> what happened on the day. But it was all good. On the outside, it all looked fine. I'm going to talk about a different event now, really different. Um, and this is around the Taekwondo World Championships. And ARC Event Consultancy were the safety consultants and event support. So we, we only worked on this in the last sort of four or five months completely different touch to some of the other events where we've completely led it all. And this was a world championships for Taekwondo, about a thousand competitors competing for the world championship, for the world to be the world champion. It took place in the Manchester Arena um, in Manchester, successfully 2019. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit about that and how different it was. So this was a small team. We had one event director and then about three other staff and a lot of interns. So um, the Taekwondo is based in Manchester. They had a partnership with Manchester Met Uni and they had a number of event students who were interns on the, on the team who worked brilliantly. But it was a really, really small team. Um, it was a really successful team. And I think this too many cooks was definitely not an issue here. There was very small and it showed how effective a small team can be. They had experts from the Taekwondo world, so somebody who really knew what they were doing with that, a brilliant um, operations lead, and then some good few consultants who were helping in different areas, um, and then these really good interns who worked really hard and uh, were well led and well and well positioned, who gave the gave them the, the space to breathe and, and develop and learn. The the venue that was used, Manchester Arena, um, for those who know it, is quite big. It's um, about 12,000 seats if you take the upper ball um, and on the ground ball, I think it's about 7,000 seats. And this, this is an agreement within Manchester City Council that you can sometimes get some good deals on Manchester Arena if Manchester City Council are involved. There's kind of a community clause within their agreement. And so Taekwondo were offered this venue at quite a reduced cost, so it made sense to take it, but they knew they weren't going to fill 7,000 seats every day with Taekwondo fans. So there's just not that many people who are Taekwondo mad. Um, so they, they were really smart in utilising the whole of the floor, as you can see on that bottom picture, um, through the mornings when they had to do lots and lots of rounds. Then every evening, they actually brought a huge curtain down and just used the end sort of um, horseshoe part of the venue. And that was um, so that they could bring, bring down the capacity to about 3,000 and sell out that 3,000 so that they could create a really um, great atmosphere and great buzz so that that felt really full. And it was a really smart use of that space and to utilize the space that they've been given on a really um, cheap basis, but make a really great atmosphere. They were also great at negotiating and getting what they wanted cheaper or for freer. And I learned loads about well, we really want it like this, but we can't quite afford it. We can't quite afford it. And, and using really good negotiating skills to get an event. They had a really small budget and they delivered a really high quality um, World Championship event. Key learnings there were, um, for me, a lot around culture. Uh, the world, world Taekwondo is based in South Korea and nearly all of the um, great and the good of Taekwondo are Korean. And the Korean culture is very male dominated, very hierarchical, um, very elderly males, especially making all the decisions. And they really struggled. The event director here, the operations director was female. I was in her team, female. The other quite senior person was female. And, and there was a lot of difficulty making decisions there. They brought over this um, taekwondo sort of gymnastics team and they wanted to put them on the stage all the time. And, and we were saying, well, you can't, we've got medal ceremonies, the TV are here for medal ceremonies, and we've got this final, and all they wanted was to put this Taekwondo display team on every time. So there was a lot of clashes of discussions and culture, and there's a lot of learnings around that. Um, a lot of the pre-planning details, because we didn't have a lot of staff, we were, we were caught out a little bit during the events, and the difficulties around media, photographers haven't been thought through, and that's where we, we struggled, because some of the pre-planning that should have been done beforehand didn't probably because we didn't have the, the right people in the team and, and it, just not enough people to look at it. 
And my main learning that I remember here was I felt like a real mum because we had all these students um, and interns. And on the Friday night, we'd been working really hard all, all week. We had this finals on the Saturday and Sunday. And they all went out to a massive party and stayed out till sort of four o'clock in the morning. And we had our briefing at seven every morning and half of them didn't turn up. When they did turn up, they looked absolutely exhausted. They were all hung over and exhausted. And we had a whole day of um, finals. And I was very um, like, you won't do that again. <laughs> or let's make some better choices, like I might say to my children. And those poor people that day had the worst day of their lives with thousands of people asking them questions when they'd been partying all night. And it was a good learning. As I said to them at the time, you probably won't do that again on an event. So I'm going to pass on to our fourth and final um, case study to Bex. Just remembering to unmute myself. So, um, yeah, this one's a bit of a different case study because I'm just going to talk through kind of actually what happened at the modern pentathlon European Champs in 2019. So I was the event director and come in quite late as event director to this and all was going fine and um, it was all kind of all set up and it was an all week event so it started on the Tuesday and um, basically by the Thursday we realised that this um, storm was going to be coming in and it was you know basically there was a lot of talk from the Thursday onwards or Thursday throughout the day going a storm's coming what are you going to do about your event are you going to cancel it? And other events in the southwest had already been cancelled. Um, so, got a short video clip which I hope to show you of just what the news was like on the um, the ninth of August. Hopefully. <coughs> I'm going to make you keep going there because I can't find it now. I had it ready to go and it isn't. So you keep talking and if I go, go I will jump in. I'm so sorry. We prepped that as well. Okay, no problem. So this was the end of the week. Just the schedule for the championships was the Friday. We had the women's qualification events. So, um, oh, here comes the video. The Met Office has issued yellow weather warnings for most of the UK today with a band of heavy rain and thunderstorms. Sound, the sound's gone. Okay. Have been called off or scaled back. Keith Doyle has more. It might be the height of summer, but what the Met Office is calling unseasonal weather is set to hit nearly all of the UK. West Lothian in Scotland already got a taste of it, with heavy rain causing localised flooding that halted almost all traffic in places. Separate weather warnings for wind, then for rain, will cover most of the UK over the weekend. High winds will hit the southwest and South Wales later today. Heavy rain along with strong winds are forecast for almost everywhere on Saturday. That forecast caused the cancellation of the Boardmasters Festival in Newquay. Police and organisers felt the summer storm was too big a risk for the 50,000 people due to attend. Most of them were expected to be camping. A hot air balloon festival was also hit, and this is the site of the Houghton Dance Music Festival in Norfolk. Despite the nice weather in these pictures, heavy rain and high winds forecast for Saturday led organisers to cancel it. Cool. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. So, I just want to put the... So, Basically, I, I just wanted to talk through kind of that was the kind of where we were on the Friday. Um, and we had to make some big decisions about what we were going to do. I and mean, if you can see from the images, we had 44 horses on site. Um, obviously, most of the setup was all done with barriers, which obviously are great at being blown over. Um, and everyone was kind of on site. Obviously, we had all the athletes on site already. This was an Olympic qualifier as well, the World Championships. So obviously we had all the top athletes from around the world and this was their opportunity to get a qualifying place for the Olympics. So a lot of pressure from a lot of different areas from the International Federation, very much kind of wanting to make it happen. You obviously had um, the, the media on you all the time going, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing? Got the spectators kind of wanting to understand, are they going to, is the event going to be happening? Do they need to get ticket refunds? Plus the athletes just knowing whether they're going to be um, competing or not or whether kind of what's happening. And I think so as with a lot of events, you have your kind of 
to delay, postponement, cancellation, documentations, which we did have, but the International Federation documents were really quite limited to say the least. And it had been something that I'd been pushing a lot with them and hadn't really received very much. So I knew that that document wasn't gonna really help me that much. And it was very much about getting the right people around the room to make a decision. And so on the, we did manage to get through all the women's qualification events on the Friday, but it was gonna be the Saturday when we knew we were gonna get hit with the um, men's final. And so Friday night, got together all the key people from the event, but actually it was only about four people. So there was really a tight group of people that I knew were gonna be the key people to help make that decision. Plus we then got obviously really detailed weather forecasts. We got on contact with the Met Weather um, down in Exeter to make sure we had the absolute, exactly what we need from a weather forecast in, in Bath, because although this uh, storm was coming across the southwest, there was a chance that actually it would go to the south of Bath, and there is <laughs> randomly in Bath, there is a, like there's the Mendips just south of Bath, and quite often storms come along the southwest that don't actually get, don't hit Bath, so there was a chance we were going to miss this storm altogether. Um, so we were kind of working it all through. On the Friday night, we took down all the marquees. We actually took all the branding off all the barrier lines. We'd already organised for all the horses. So we'd spoken with all the owners of the 44 horses to find out exactly what their horses' welfare needs were during this kind of storm environment. I was very nervous that the, the stables that we've got were all going to just get blown away. So we wanted the horses out of the temporary stables. So a lot of them went into their horse boxes. Some of the horses actually, what they often do is just put them into the field. So we had to create an additional kind of fenced off area for all the horses to go into. Um, so there was a lot of things that we did on the Friday night in preparation for waking up on Saturday morning and seeing a bit of a disaster area. Um, the other thing we did decide on the Friday night um, was actually the, the key thing we needed to do was basically move all the outdoor events back and understanding exactly how long it was going to take for the event championships to be completed. So my key thing was we had to make some decisions. We had to let people know as soon as possible. We couldn't just keep waiting. The International Federation kept saying, oh, we'll just wait, we'll just wait, we'll just wait. And I was like, no, 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 we need to make actual decisions so that we can inform everyone so everyone knew what was going to happen on the Saturday. So on the Saturday morning, we had a meeting with um, everybody in the room and I went through exactly what the plan was, that we were going to do all the morning events. And then at one o'clock, Instead of the outdoor event starting at one, we're going to push them back to a five o'clock start. The storm looked like it was going to pass through by about 4.30. So we weren't giving ourselves much buffer, but we didn't really have much buffer because otherwise it's going to get dark. Um, so, and actually making that decision meant that we could inform all the spectators. So we actually created a whole indoor area for everyone to try out different sports and we increased that on the Saturday we got more volunteers down to ensure that we could have something for the volunteers to do in that time we actually put on more catering for the volunteers as well um, and we just made sure that everyone was able to stay later we also informed the athletes that they were able to pre pre prepare themselves for that wait between the um the sports and we then got to one o'clock and the storm really did come in I mean all the barriers got blown down as you can see from the um we had put them up trying to think that we'd be all right, but we weren't. Um, and you can see the puddles that were created um, outside the athletes area. So we had lots of brooms, but we were very fortunate. Literally the weather forecast was bang on. And at 4.30, literally you started to see the light and the sun started to come through. And we were able to start competition at five o'clock. Um, so we completed the men's final. It all went to plan, but it was a really kind of challenging time and really put all our kind of plans in place and just but my key learnings from it were very much about making a decision and sticking with it and making sure you have the confidence to do that um making sure you've got your key people around you that can help you make those decisions so understand who those key people are that you're going to be making decisions with and make sure you've got really good weather forecast <laughs> because especially for outdoor events just making sure that you know you know you're looking at the five different types of weather forecasts and looking at some of them now are amazing of obviously show you where the clouds are um, and yeah really really good so really lots of good learnings um, really and obviously quite a big successful event and actually the International Federation said it was one of the best events they'd ever had and I think not just from kind of I think just from a sometimes especially in modern times they don't always make decisions very clearly so I think 
they're coming back to the World Championships next year. So I think obviously they were quite pleased with how it all went. So moving on, um, Claire's just going to talk through now some of our kind of key top tips. Thank you, Bex, and um, thanks to everybody who's helped us with some, put together some top tips on uh, different events, what to think about, what not to think about, um, and our sort of cumulative 40 years of experience coming together. So number one tip is it's all about the people. I think when your back's against the wall on different events, um, it's the people that make it happen. I know when I was doing the test event um, in London 2012, we had to end up doing briefings to COBRA and briefings to transport ministers and organising committees and going to six hour a meeting every six hours for about five days. It was the people that got us through and there was a really brilliant person at Westminster Council who was really calm and supportive and really helped um, to get through that time. And I think building relationships with those people is never can never be underestimated. Everything comes down to people helping you out on an event. The, um, the next one is about being glamorous. Um, I think I have quite a lot of friends who think that I have some glamorous life working on major sports events and it does sound really exciting and it does sound really glamorous. I don't think I've ever been on an event that I haven't talked about toilets and I don't think I've ever had one where I'm not scrubbing some sort of um, side, some tape off the back of a sign or fixing something at the dead of night onto the floor or doing something that's completely not glamorous. I know I'm working a little bit on the Commonwealth Games this summer and I just feel like all we're talking about at the moment is toilets and how many do we need and when are they getting cleaned and what we're doing. So it's definitely um, not about the glamour, it's definitely about the hard yards and the work behind, um, behind the scenes. Every, every event that we go to now, and I think this has been drummed into us over the years, is every decision we're always thinking about what is reasonable and what is practicable. And this comes down to the law around um, responsibility and safety at different events. Every event that we ever go to, we always say we, we want it to be safe. And we're working on one event at the moment, Rugby League World Cup, and the, some of the people in the team just want it to be the best and the boldest and the most brilliant and the most inclusive. And we're like, we want it to be safe. And um, coming back to that quite often comes back to the legislation around safety at sports grounds. And, every decision that you make, if you're ever in standing in the dock, you have to be, make sure that your decision was reasonable and that it was practicable. And that's especially when you're outside of a big um, venue or you know on a road event or on a modern pentathlon event, is it reasonable to make that decision? And is it practicable? Because it might be reasonable at the Olympics to have 50 stewards, one on every door. It, it's not reasonable at the Special Olympics to have 50 stewards on every door. Um, because you don't have the money and it's not that level of event. So it's being reasonable and I think that level headedness and that um, being able to bring everything down to those factors really helps us making some decisions sometimes. Um, I think this next point brings up Bex's point around making a decision. Some of the worst um, times that I've had on events is where people haven't been able to make a decision and you can't move forward with the planning if no decision is made. You have to just make the best decision that you can with the information that you've got available. It might turn out in six months time that was the wrong decision and you might switch it or change it or go with it. But it's much better to have made that decision than not made a decision. And I think that's really hard sometimes for people. And I know in the experience of uh, Bex talking about making a decision, we're going to delay, making a decision, we're going to cancel. Um, it's a really hard decision. But sometimes once you've made that decision, it's much easier to move forward and it's the only way to move forward. Expecting the unexpected. Um, I think we always say you've got this wonderful plan for this event and then when people turn up the plan can go out of the window a little bit and none more so than the public or uh, participants. Bex and I have done a lot of work over at Archivet Consultancy on the school games, national finals and that's for athletes, young people aged between mainly about 16 to 18 or 16 to 19. And they get up to all sorts of shenanigans that we're never just aware of and being expecting the unexpected and being prepared for that, um, that contingency planning and how important that is, is a really key um, part of events and event, event delivery. I think the COVID planning we just wanted to put in because um, I know it's sort of 
calming down a little bit now but I think it's taught a lot of us that um it's another event some things like this can happen and as event uh, professionals we have to deal with it and it often comes back to us to deal with it when we've done events in the covid environment you've always got another event on top of your event so you're thinking how is the well, how are we doing testing how are we doing isolation rooms how are we doing um if people are in isolation, how we're feeding them, how we're transporting them, how we're looking after them, how we're dealing with them medically. Have we got another medical team on top of that? So it was really thinking that as event professionals, we're, we're ready for everything, but that COVID plan has brought it to another level. And actually this year, now that some of those um, COVID restrictions are easing in society, especially in the UK, it suddenly seems a bit easier because you don't have these two levels of planning that we all went through last year and we all had that COVID planning on top and uh, um, all the different restrictions that came with that. So it was a, another top tip of um, being prepared, being organised and having, um, having lots of plans and having lots of documents, having lots of plans in place to run those good events. Is there anything that I missed, Bex? Do you want to add anything else in? No, I thought that was great, great rundown. I was going to say we have got a few questions that have come through on the chat, which I will um, just go through. I'm, if, if it's OK, I'll just kind of ask the questions on behalf of people rather than trying to get people to come in and out just because of timings. So we've got a question from Farah to say, do crisis situations like what you've just mentioned impact the budget planning or is this something you plan for at the start? Um, so my response to that would be, I think, Initially, when you do the initial budget planning, it is really important to make sure you do have the contingency budget. Um, every budget we do kind of for kind of future events, we do quite a lot of feasibility studies kind of moving forward. Um, we do always plan in some contingency budget because that is needed. Things do turn up for events. You can't, however much you plan in advance, if you're planning two years in advance, four years in advance, seven years, you always need to have that budget that you can go to for different situations. Um, so, yeah, it's not always an easy thing to do, um, but it's definitely worth trying to do. And I know for smaller events that can become even more difficult, but having some flexibility within your budget is really important. Um, Claire, if you want to answer the next one, I've got one here, which is, um, a second, how do we work on creating a legacy after an event? It's a really good question and from ARC event consultancy point of view it just depends how we're involved in different ways. I think we're finding um, and at the moment in the UK that the legacy event is becoming more of a sort of social, it's moving into sort of social impact world so it's not just what's happening after an event but it's what's happening before an event, during an event and after an event and that events are becoming a lot more targeted about how they impact their communities and how they impact um, people involved in the sport or people in the, in the wider world in a positive way. And these can be really, really varied from um, working with sports, grassroots sports, and the legacy that that might bring for hosting a major event in a, in a sport. The Taekwondo that I did, their key target was school children, are getting school children in Manchester to the Taekwondo to give them the inspiration to come and get on a mat and try out the sport and get more people into the sport. In a Rugby League World Cup they were working on, they have a huge social impact programme which is investing in facilities and local clubs to leave a lasting legacy. But it's actually been in the three years before the event that they've brought in money um, to give a, a solid legacy of facilities. Um, whereas others can be more softer social legacy like Special Olympics where it was um, investing in clubs for the long longevity of those clubs after the after the event has come so I think legacy kind of is a bit of an old-fashioned word now you hear a bit more about social impact across a whole spectrum of an event planning through to through to after the event and it can be so many different things so many different people so it's something we're really excited about and ensuring when we're looking at funding partners at the moment they're almost looking at that before the event like how does this impact on society especially coming out of COVID, well-being, volunteer programmes, um, getting active, getting those different things. So I think it's a real, there is a real onus on event organisers to be really clear on what their targets are and how that event can impact positively on, um, on society. Um, can't do everything for everyone, but being quite targeted can make some real differences. And it's something I know Bex is working on for the uh, Modern Pentathlon World Championships next year, thinking how can we positively impact people because of this event and because of the, the power that this event can bring. 
Great. Thanks, Claire. And um, next one is um, from, sorry, I've, I haven't been saying the name, sorry, Manu Sharma, um, just to ask regarding um, opportunities for new graduates to, to work in sport events. Um, so I think the re at the moment, there are lots of sport events happening in the UK. We're really fortunate that we're, this over the next few years, there's some great opportunities. Um, I would say, you know, volunteering is a really good way to initially get into these events, but there's also, um, I know that there's something called event people, which is very much about getting graduates kind of working on events um, that's been set up by Massive, um, and that's been really good. So that's something that I've definitely seen on LinkedIn. I would also say, you know, throughout this network on LinkedIn, that you will definitely find opportunities where you can find out about kind of all, all the different sport events that are happening. I know Commonwealth Games are recruiting a lot of people at the moment and not expecting people to have experience for some of the roles. So again, it's really worth just looking in and just kind of really happy to, you know, if on LinkedIn, if you see people, then ask them directly. I'm sure they'll be able to put you in touch with the right people throughout, you know, through this women's sport collective. So yeah, there's lots of opportunities and I think just really reach out wherever you can. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so yeah, that's kind of, Anything else just, there on that? Just one thing on that is that just take any opportunity because we do quite a bit of work with some universities and I know some students might think, oh, that's not a great opportunity to be a steward on Manchester City football ground for a day. But actually you can learn a lot and whatever experience it is, you can learn a lot and build some good networks and then you've got something extra on your CV for the next one. So I would be saying um, try not to be too picky and try and get as much varied, wide experience as you can. Um, I'm going to I'm, jump in and ask one question before we go to the next one, if I can do. I'm allowed to do that because I'm hosting. Um, Claire, you said it was the worst year of your life at London 2012 and you, I wrote down, I really didn't enjoy it. So I guess what I'm interested to know, what keeps you and drives you in this world of events? Why, why at that point did you not think I could do so? I'm a brilliant woman. There's many things I could do. Why did you not move on to something else? Good question. And I think the, the answer is that I love events. I love every other event that I've worked on. I get so much out of it. I think that role in that event was a really pressurised role with, it was kind of middle tier at Lowcock. So you had all the bosses on top asking you all the questions. You had everybody underneath asking you the different questions. And it was so intense. It was, um, you just have to give up your life for it. You, I didn't, I'd just been, I just got married. I didn't see my husband. You couldn't go on holiday. You couldn't breathe. You couldn't think of anything. I missed so many family occasions or anything else. And I think that was one of the reasons of setting up ARC. I, I remember in that year, we had loads of consultants turning up to LOCOG who were like, oh, I'll do just the event control bit, or I'll just do this bit, or I'll just do, and I was like, I want to do that. You know, they're getting sleep at night. They're not so overwhelmed by this that you cannot breathe or do anything else. And I think part of that is being, running through event, ARC event consultancy is quite often we are consultants now, or we work on something part-time, or we take a role as an advise, in an advisory capacity, look at feasibility studies or different things. And we're still very much involved in events or support at events, but not in that role. And I wouldn't want to do a role like that again, that completely takes over your life and completely different. So I got so much out of it and I learned so much about it. And now I can go and be at Paris 2024, one of those consultants who comes in and I still love it and I still get it. But that role for me was really, really difficult, pressurised and took away everything else in my life because you had to give it all to, to that role, I think. And, um, and that's, that's, that was the reason. So I still love events, I always would. Those roles are really difficult. And I think um, any, any of that leadership role where you're sort of on your own a little bit, but that because it was in such a pressurised environment. And also I was only 31 or so, I was quite young compared to everybody else I was working. And in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have been in that role, but it was, you know, when we were looking around, there was nobody else to take it. And, I perhaps didn't have the strength and depth of emotion and experience that I would have now to be able to go into that event and take that on sort of holistically. Brilliant. Thank you. Sorry, Bex, back oh. to you. All right, sorry, yeah. Um, so there's one about um, payment platforms and from Emma O'Connor, so thanks for that. Um, I would say, 
I think that's probably a really good question to put to the Women's Sport Collective, because I actually think within the collective, there's probably going to be a lot more experience regarding all the different kind of platforms out there and how to kind of get spectator payments, etc. So personally, I don't think I'm in a position to kind of specify certain companies to use. But I do think if you were to put that question out, that's definitely something that would, people would come back to you and you'd get a more varied view on that. If that's, I know it's probably copping out slightly, but um, I, hopefully that I think that's hopefully where you probably get the best information regarding that. Um, we've then got um, Jess, how much have you considered environmental sustainability events? Do you have any tips for how we could make smaller events with smaller budgets more sustainable? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I know that it's definitely at the forefront of everyone's mind at the moment. I think absolutely events need to be being more sustainable. They're absolutely one of the key things that you know, we're kind of on and off sites, everything's very quick use. You think of, I mean, I look back to all the mass participation events we did and the number of water bottles and number of plastic cups and all of that side of things. And I, I know that there's definitely ways and means of kind of making that more sustainable. And I know that some of the companies out there are doing loads of great things regarding becoming more sustainable. And I think as a, you know, as an organization, um, sorry, as an industry, there's lots of work going on at the moment. I, I do think I've been to a few um, kind of conferences and actually um, I do feel that festivals are really leading the way regarding their sustainability and what they're doing at the festivals. And if you, um, I, I do know that there's some really good sharing in some of kind of the magazines online um, regarding what they are doing to kind of make their festivals more sustainable. So again, probably not giving you the exact answer for that um, but I do think there's lots out there kind of that you can do kind of to make small inroads and I think it's very much about working with your suppliers really challenging your suppliers to see what they're doing to be more sustainable really thinking about what you're doing you know actually for like for the school games for example we actually looked at everyone what what the medals were made out of and actually had more sustainable medals we're looking at all the branding we're like challenging the suppliers with kind of how we can have better kind of more sustainable branding we're reusing that branding year on year so rather than trying to get rid of the branding looking at taking dates off all of the um the, the branding that we put up so i think everything that you're doing for events is just thinking through okay is there a better way of doing this is there a way of making this more sustainable and actually you'll often find that there is and also there are lots of ways lots of forums out there where that kind of information is being shared so hopefully that helps a little bit um, and then there's a question from, there's quite, there are quite a few more questions keep going through, I'm not keeping up, but um, would you say that for someone who doesn't have experience yet, but wants to work in the sport industry, especially events, volunteering would be a right place to start? Um, Claire's nodding. <laughs> I would say yes, great, and take every opportunity to try and meet as many people there as you can, and um, it's really good experience, and more that you can talk about in the next job job interview. I think Thanks. the rest of the comments are more of people yeah. saying thank yeah. you so much. I've got one more quick question. A couple of times you mentioned in the presentation that you were brought in quite late. Uh, is there something around that, you know, are we thinking early enough when we're planning events? Is that something that all events could be doing better is to start planning earlier? Am I in a, you know, a perfect world of things, but is that something that generally happens, do you think? Yeah, I think often with, again, it comes down to the contingency planning and kind of the staffing on events. I think quite often people try and do events with kind of limited staffing and then actually those staff get really stressed. And I actually think thinking about the welfare of the people working on events is really, really important. Um, so I think that's often when we get brought in is because people just haven't been able to cope with what's been put in front of them. So we then come in and are able to kind of deliver I guess because from we've got the experience we've got but yeah I think often it's just events are hard and I think it's really thinking through how you can manage the team how you can manage the staff what you need making sure you're kind of really putting in place enough budget to support people um, going through but also bringing in the right expertise at the right times because I think actually you do need quite specific expertise depending on the event you're delivering um, and you know I think that really really helps so yeah, I, th I think that's probably why we've been brought in late. Claire, do you want to have anything to that? No, I think it's just when when you know things are coming up thick and fast, you sometimes just need that a bit of extra help that budgets might be released later on because you're like, we need it rather than earlier on. 
there's so people have to fight for it. But. Brilliant. Thank you so, so much to the both of you for joining us today. We really, really appreciate that. And we'll, we'll share the video of this, um, oh, back on main screen. We'll share the video of this presentation. And also we'll share Bex and, and Claire's details and they're in the LinkedIn group. And as they said, if you've got questions, I mean, we do really want the LinkedIn group to be used for that. So if even this has stimulated some general questions, just use the LinkedIn group for that because uh, it does seem like it's very kind of interactive and people are happy to help and share. But thank you so much to you. Good luck for the summer and the, you know, World, Rugby, World, um, Rugby League World Cup and everything else that you're working on too and Com Games and it's a yeah, busy few months ahead, I'm sure. But um, we hope to attend some of them and see some of your work in action. Uh, and I'm sure people will connect with you from here too. So thank you so much for, for your time today. Oh, good luck to everyone delivering events this summer as well, because I know that there's lots of people on here who are going to be working on events and it's a really exciting summer ahead. So good luck to everyone that's doing stuff. So. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Talk to you all soon. Another networking meeting. <laughs>